Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday night Bible study of Fellowship Bible Chapel. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 16 and I've entitled this teaching put what remained into order and that comes directly from Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Now as we study the book of Titus we're going to find that there were at least uh, three major points that Paul wanted to make. Uh, the first one is putting these things into order uh, in, in the church uh, that was located uh, in Crete. The second is an emphasis on sound doctrine, and we'll be looking at that topic and subject next week when we study the first paragraph of Titus chapter 2. And then finally, an emphasis on being ready to perform or practice good works or good deeds. It's a phrase that's used uh, a handful of times in the book of Titus uh, and uh, emphasized throughout the three chapters. So tonight, before we actually jump into Titus chapter one, I thought it might be helpful to do a little background from the perspective of, of Paul and his relationship with Titus and how the gospel ended up on the island of Crete in the first place. So we're going to be doing a very quick overview. And to start, I want to take a look at the first chapter of the book of Galatians. So Galatians chapter one, and I'm going to be reading uh, a, a lengthy passage. I'll be reading uh, Galatians chapter one, um, beginning with verse 11 through the end of, of the chapter. And then when I get to the end of chapter one, we're gonna uh, go to the next slide and take a look at a couple of verses in chapter two that highlight uh, some things that Paul shares about Titus to the believers there uh, in the churches of Galatia. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the tradition of the fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, another name for Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Now, I just want to make a couple of comments uh, about uh, this section that I just read. First of all, I, I want to uh, emphasize that after Paul got saved, he spent about three years in the desert being trained and taught directly by Jesus Christ. He did not sit at the feet of the apostles. He did, did not get his uh, theology from Peter 
and the rest of the apostles in Jerusalem. He got his training and instruction directly from Jesus Christ. When he did go visit Peter uh, three years later, he only spent about two weeks there, not enough time to be indoctrinated. So the whole point there is emphasizing that Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ who was chosen directly by our Lord to preach the gospel. All right, so we're gonna take a look at uh, the next slide and read a couple of verses uh, or emphasize a couple of verses, uh, but I'll, I'll actually read verses um, one through, uh, one through three. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Now, this information contained in the, um, the book of Galatians is important for us as we study the book of Titus because it tells us several things. First of all, it tells us that Titus was Greek. And uh, even though he was a Gentile, uh, he was not circumcised by Paul. And, and this is important uh, because that's going to play a role in helping us to understand what transpires in the first uh, chapter of uh, the book of Titus. So Titus went along with him to Jerusalem uh, uh, when he was actually ministering with Barnabas and were uh, instructed that Titus was not circumcised even though he was a Gentile. All right, so let's now take a look at the next slide, which uh, is directing our attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 16 to 24. And I've, I've titled this slide, uh, a, a Testimony of Titus. And I'm only going to read two verses uh, in this section, uh, the, the two verses that actually uh, name Titus by name verse 16, as well as verse 23. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. That's a, a, a very strong commendation of the ministry of Titus from the Apostle Paul. And then he mentions down in verse 23, and as for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. So Titus is an individual that Paul discipled and mentored and trained to be a pastor, trained to be an elder. And he then sent Titus off or left Titus in Crete to put into order what remained so that the church would be organized and would function correctly and the believers in the church at Crete would, le would lead Christian lives which were, were honoring uh, to God the Father uh, as well as to the Lord Jesus Christ. One final background passage is uh, contained in our next slide. In Acts chapter 2, uh, on the day of Pentecost, when, when Peter preached that message, we're told uh, before Peter started preaching that there were uh, uh, Jews uh, attending uh, the, the, from all over the Roman Empire. And it mentions uh, Parthians and Medes, beginning in verse 9, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pont Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, 
both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So there were there were actually uh, proselytes to Judaism, uh, or or perhaps even Jews themselves who were living on the island of Crete, who went to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because that was the feast of Pentecost, uh, the fourth. Uh, feast of the Lord on the Jewish calendar, and it was one of three feasts that that God commanded the Jews to attend in person in Jerusalem. God did that by design and intentionally because he wanted uh, a significant number of Jews there when the church actually came into being. And so uh, if there were hundreds of thousands of Jews, perhaps uh, a million Jews or more, only 3,000 of them came to Christ on that initial day. And now it seems like a big number to us, but the point is that it was a remnant who believed. Uh, of, of all of those Jews who were attending to observe uh, the, the Feast of Pentecost, or also known as the Feast of Weeks, uh, only 3,000 uh, came to faith. But some of those who attended and who heard the apostles speaking in tongues, some of those were actually from Crete. And perhaps they believed and took the gospel back to the island uh, with them. Okay, so let's jump into uh, the passage for this evening starting with Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So this is one of, one of the main occasions for writing the book itself, so that Titus could appoint elders in every town. So from that, we can conclude that each town had its own individual church, and they were scattered around the island, and so that also Titus could put things in, in order regarding how the church should function, what they should believe, teach them sound doctrine, etc. Now, I want to highlight uh, some, some terms in here. The first uh, thing I want to highlight is the word why. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, this is one of the reasons why, why Paul left Titus in Crete, so that he could uh, begin to establish this church and get it situated and get it functioning in a proper way. And he wanted to do it in an orderly fashion. Now, this word that's uh, translated put into order, it's actually uh, a Greek verb, and it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, word. It's, it's a compound word, epi de ortho. And if, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the term um, orthopedic or orthotics, you know that that uh, deals with uh, straightening things or putting things back into their proper position. And, and that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to uh, have Titus put these things in their proper place, in their proper position, so that they would function in an orderly uh, manner. And one of those things was to appoint elders in every town. Now we're gonna find uh, out as we uh, look at verse seven tonight, the very next verse, that Paul actually uses the term elder and the term overseer, sometimes translated bishop, interchangeably. He uses them 
uh, as though they're speaking about the same person in the same office, because indeed that is what uh, he is doing. And we know this because of the book of Titus in chapter one, verses six and seven, but also because of 1 Timothy chapter three, when Paul talks about the qualifications for the office of overseer and lists many of the same qualifications uh, that are listed for the uh, office of elder in Titus chapter one. Now, the word elder is the Greek word presbyteros. And I'm sure many of you recognize that that is where we get the English term presbyterian. In verse 7, the Greek word for overseer is episkopos. And of course, that's where we get the English word Episcopal or Episcopalian. And so we've got two major denominations who take their name from their form of church government and the, the actual term of oversight uh, that is declared in the New Testament. So taking a look at verses six through eight. Now, when we study these three verses, uh, I am going to uh, apologize up front because I am not going to attempt to unpack every single term in these three verses. Uh, to do so uh, and to do so properly would take the entire hour, if not longer. And so, I'm going to highlight uh, three, perhaps four, of uh, the actual uh, characteristics that are uh, highlighted in, in these three verses. But I would encourage you that are interested to study this passage in Titus, uh, Titus chapter 1 and compare it with the passage in 1 Timothy 3 uh, in the beginning of uh, that chapter for the qualifications uh, for elder and overseer. And notice that there's a significant um, phenomenon going on. You know, when, when churches choose a leader or choose a pastor or, uh, you know, look for uh, a, a shepherd to, to guide their congregation, uh, it doesn't always happen this way, but often the people that uh, are in charge of the pastoral search committee will be looking for individuals that have a particular skill set or perhaps particular communication um, talents. And in the New Testament, in these two uh, in these two passages, it emphasizes character qualities much more extensively than ability. Uh, in fact, the one main ability that is emphasized uh, in, in each of these two passages, Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3, is the ability to teach. 1 Timothy 3 says simply, apt to teach. And then in Titus chapter 1, in verse 9, he expands on that somewhat. And, and I'll be looking at that in detail uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. But I, I want you to recognize that, that God doesn't emphasize ability when it comes to leadership within the church. He emphasizes the quality of the man's character first, and then also uh, underscores his ability to teach the Bible, which presumes and assumes that that individual knows and understands the Bible and is able to communicate it in an effective manner. Okay, so the, the very first thing that is mentioned here, if anyone is above reproach. 
if anyone is above reproach. Now, this is mentioned twice in the passage. It's mentioned in verse 6, but then it's also uh, repeated in verse 7, where it says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. And for those who, of you who have studied uh, the Bible or perhaps sat in, in one of my Bible studies over the years, you no doubt remember that when the Spirit of God leads an individual author of Scripture to re repeat the same uh, thought or the same principle or concept in the same passage, that's done in order to emphasize and underscore that principle. So the fact that the elder must be above reproach is mentioned twice in successive verses. That, in, in, in our minds, should be underscored and capitalized with multiple exclamation points after it. Being blameless, being unreprovable, um, not you know, not uh, being called into account, unaccused, all of those terms uh, are important for an elder. Now, let me make something very clear here. This does not mean, and this is not suggest, suggesting, because the Bible does not teach this, that an elder is to be sinless. But what it does mean is that an elder is growing in his faith and growing in his Christian life, and he is sinning less and less. And there is no characteristic sins in his life that are being committed over and over and over. In other words, he is blameless. He is above reproach. He does not have to be reproved regarding anything. And as he sins, and as he confesses his sin, and as the Spirit of God makes these sins known in his life, he then confesses them and moves on with his Christian walk. The point is, there's not one or more sins in his life that people could come and bring a charge against his account. If that were the case, he would be disqualified and he should step down uh, from his position uh, if that were the case. Okay, so if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. Now, if I wanted to take the easy way out, I would conveniently skip over this qualification, because this is perhaps the most controversial qualification in the list, simply because of its uh, connection to uh, or understanding of uh, uh, divorce, as it's taught in the Bible, uh, and the subject of divorce and remarriage. And so, um, while I don't want to be controversial, uh, I do want to share a couple of things uh, about this character quality or, or, or this uh, principle in an elder's life. To be a one-woman man or to be the, you know, the husband of one wife obviously means that you are devoted to your wife, your one and only wife. Now, some believe that this means that an elder cannot be divorced. And if a person believes that, then they also believe that an elder cannot be divorced and remarried. And you have to come to your own conclusions regarding this. And I would encourage you to study the passages, and I'm going to give you a list of about six passages uh, in the Bible that deal with divorce. And uh, if you've never done this study before, you should. And 
I, I will let you know, I have a, what would be considered a relatively conservative view uh, of divorce from a biblical perspective. Uh, I, I am not as uh, conservative in my view as some of my brothers. And while I might disagree with them, I respect of their view and I honor them for their view because they are consistent uh, in their approach. So the, the uh, six passages uh, I would encourage you to study are Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. In Deuteronomy 24, it talks about someone who is divorced and then gets remarried and then gets divorced a second time. They're forbidden to go back and marry their first spouse. It's absolutely forbidden in the Torah. In Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8, we read that God gave a decree of divorce to Israel. So whatever your view is on divorce, you need to understand that God divorced Israel in the Old Testament when she was committing adultery and idolatry and was, was guilty of guilty of spiritual unfaithfulness to her husband. You need to study through that passage and, 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 and you need to do it humbly and try to wrap your head around that. Uh, in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, this is a key text where God declares, I hate divorce. Pretty strong statement. Then you have what is sometimes referred to as the exception clauses, Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32 in the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9, uh, is kind of an expansion on that uh, teaching that he did on the Sermon on the Mount. And in both cases, Jesus says that if you divorce for any reason other than marital unfaithfulness, um, then you uh, are, you know, committing adultery. Um, and so uh, you need to study that passage. And then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about someone who is a believer and has an unbelieving spouse. If their unbelieving spouse deserts them, Paul says that, that they are no longer bound or they are no longer enslaved to the relationship. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily tell us uh, what that specifically means. And you have to study the other passages and come to a conclusion uh, about divorce and about divorce and remarriage uh, in, in, in order to... Um, understand what Paul is declaring uh, in that passage. So all of that to say, I would encourage you uh, to study about these things and uh, to make sure that you consider these passages as well as others uh, in the Bible when you do that. All right. I'm sure I got myself in enough hot water. Uh, for this evening, so let's go ahead and move on. It says in verse three that his children are believers. In some translations, it uh, I think it translates it that he has faithful children and that they're not accused of debauchery or insubordination. Now, I had a professor in seminary that actually uh, was an elder, and he taught on this passage from Titus that not only does an elder have to be the husband of one wife, one and only one, but he has to have at least two children, and those two children have to believe, uh, and they can't be unbelievers. And if they are unbelievers, then he's not qualified. Uh, this particular professor 
uh, was incredibly consistent in his view. And I learned that after he left the seminary and went to teach um, at another Christian institution and uh, was an elder in a local church in that community, I learned that when his, uh, his wife uh, died an untimely death, I believe she was in her 50s at the time, that he stepped down from being an elder because he believed that he was no longer the husband of one wife. Now, that seems like an extreme view, but again, he was trying to be consistent with what he believed the scriptures to teach. And so, I, I, I share these things to caution you about automatically uh, aiming a, a theological howitzer at someone who has a different take or a different view of these individual quali qualities and characteristics. And to, you know, to humbly approach the text and to make a good faith effort to understand this passage uh, based upon uh, your ability to look into the word of God and based upon the uh, ministry of illumination of the spirit of God uh, in your life. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on. As I mentioned before, in verse seven, it says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Uh, he, he's not to be a pugilist. <laughs> he can't be getting into brawls. Uh, he needs to be even-tempered. And as we, as we read in verse 8, he needs to be hospitable, a lover, self-controlled. Self-controlled. Now, this word self-controlled is uh, the Greek uh, adjective uh, egkratos. And uh, the, the noun form of this uh, word actually uh, can be seen in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23. Uh, the final fruit of the Spirit, uh, as well as 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. He must be self-controlled. When an elder loses it and loses it in public, that's bad. I can recall uh, when an elder actually lost it in a in a public service on a Sunday morning and lost it in a graphic and significant way. And when he kind of regained his, uh, you know, his senses <laughs> and settled down, he later asked one of his fellow, you know, fellow, uh, you know, elders, you know, am I done? And he said, yes. And I'm not going to go into details and I'm not going to, you know, share specifically what he did, but he disqualified himself that Sunday morning by his actions. And it's important for us to know that actions have consequences. You know, when a, when a, a pastor or a spiritual leader is maritally unfaithful, or is, uh, you know, sexually, uh, you know, active in an inappropriate way, they've disqualified themselves from oversight ministry, in my opinion. Um, I, I don't think that you should remain in the office of pastor or uh, as an elder or an, or an overseer in a local church if if you have committed adultery, or if you have uh, committed um, sexual acts with another individual other than your wife, uh, you know I I feel very strongly about that. 
Now, that doesn't mean the individual can't be restored to fellowship. He should be. He should be called to repent. He should be held accountable. And if he does repent, he should be restored to fellowship. But I don't believe he should automatically be restored to his position. And some believe that he should never be restored. Uh, you know, once they, you know, cross that, you know, particular line. Again, there's wide differences of opinion uh, on these matters, but they are important. And we should approach them uh, carefully and, and, and cautiously, uh, seeking to know and understand uh, the meaning of the text and and how we should apply these things in the context of the church. Okay, so let's go back to our text. And I lost my computer screen here for a moment. And let's go ahead and let's let's go ahead and move on to to verse to verse nine. Um, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, this is a this is an ability verse. He has to be able to handle the word of God. He has to be able to teach sound doctrine. And he has to be able to teach what has been taught, what has been taught by the apostles, what the apostles were taught by Jesus Christ. And he also not only has to be able to to teach sound doctrine, but he also uh, has to have the ability to uh, to uh, refute those who contradict the word of God, or to refute those who are false teachers, or to refute those who teach incorrectly. Now, this is a somewhat controversial verse from a practical point of view within the body of Christ, because there are many churches that don't, you know, that, that don't practice this um, on an eldership level. They do not want to call out the names of false teachers. They do not want to uh, contradict people who uh, are teaching things that are unbiblical. You know, they, they simply want to focus on teaching sound doctrine. But Paul says both are necessary. I believe they're two sides of the same coin, teaching sound doctrine, but also refuting those who contradict that sound doctrine. And Paul was in the habit of naming people by names. In fact, he did it uh, in the uh, pastoral epistles of not only 1 Timothy, but also 2 Timothy, calling out individuals that were, had either fallen away from the faith or were teaching things which should not be taught. And it's not like you have to be mean-spirited. It's not like you have to be obnoxious or ungodly when you do it. In fact, you should be humble when you do it, because we should take heed lest we fall ourselves. But if someone is teaching false doctrine, if someone is teaching something other than sound doctrine, that should be highlighted, and that should be met head on, and that should be confronted lovingly, righteously, in a godly manner, but confronted nonetheless. Okay, now, the rest of the chapter is an, as actually an extended paragraph 
dealing with Paul's emphasis of the last phrase in verse 9. He must also be able to review, rebuke those who contradict it. And he then uh, goes on to take uh, seven verses to explain what he means by that. It's not that he just says you have to be able to refute those who contradict. He then takes seven verses to, to give an illustration uh, that was relevant uh, in in, in the days that the book of Titus was written and was relevant on the island of Crete itself. Notice what he writes in verses 10 and following. First of all, verses 10 and 11. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. Paul is not pulling punches here. He is not candy coating it on any level. He's saying that these false teachers and these empty talkers and these insubordinate deceivers must be silenced. And you silence them with sound doctrine, demonstrating that what they are teaching does not line up with the word of God. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Paul is wanting to refute those of the circumcision party. Now, this is interesting because we learn about the circumcision part, party in several verses in the New Testament. Now, when I refer to the circumcision party, more often than not, I'm not talking about followers of Judaism. I'm talking about Jews who have converted to Christianity, but who are putting an inordinate emphasis on things like circumcision and emphasizing the works of the law and on occasion, calling for Gentiles uh, to actually come under, uh, come under that law and embrace that requirement. And so that's, that's what I understand the circumcision party to mean in Titus chapter 1. Uh, it's, it's what I believe is meant in Acts chapter 11. Let me read for you verses 1 through 4 of Acts chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were thro throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And that's because of Peter going to the house of Cornelius, uh, Cornelius being the first Gentile convert. Heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Acts 11, verse 1. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But when Peter began and explained it to them in order, but excuse me, Peter began and explained it to them in order. In other words, he explained to them that the gospel had fallen upon these Gentiles and they had embraced and received the gospel and we should embrace and receive them. Even though they're uncircumcised, they are recipients of the grace of God. They are recipients of salvation. Circumcision is not a requirement to the household of faith. Circumcision was a requirement placed upon Israel in the law of Moses. And, and Paul wants believers in whatever church he's writing to, to understand that, that circumcision is not a requirement for Gentile believers in Jesus Christ. The circumcision party is also mentioned in Galatians chapter 2, verses uh, 11 through 14. 
Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. But when Cephas, that's another name for Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Can you imagine that? You know, Peter was kind of viewed as the leader of the apostles in Jerusalem. And here is the apostle Paul who is opposing him to his face because of what he did. When he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, and that's James, the half-brother of the Lord, um, and I believe that 1 Corinthians 15, as, uh, as well as um, Galatians, tells us that, that James was also an apostle of Jesus Christ. He actually came to believe in Christ once Jesus arose from the dead. He was eating with the Gentiles. That is, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when he drew back and separated himself, but, but when they came, excuse me, certain men came from James. When they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. In other words, fearing, uh, fearing these um, believers, Jewish believers in Jesus Christ, who were putting an inordinate emphasis on circumcision, and especially as it pertained to Gentiles. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So going back to Titus chapter 1 and verse 10, this circumcision party, I believe, is not talking about the followers of rabbinic Judaism of the day who needed to repent and believe in the gospel in order to be saved, but rather these were Jews who had embraced the gospel, but were taking the law of Moses and taking that with them into their Christian faith. And uh, they uh, were putting people under the law in effect. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And this is probably my favorite slide tonight. Uh, I'm glad that I've got uh, at least 10 minutes left because uh, I, I always get a kick uh, when, when I read this passage. Um, I, you know, I always smile when I, when I read this. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Now, I want to give you some encouragement tonight. Those of you who might be discouraged. Those of you who are troubled by what happened in our country in the last six to nine months, when our country was literally on fire and lawlessness was rampant. Those of you who might be discouraged with the result of November 3rd and the tragic events of January the 6th, I want to encourage you about something. Regardless of what is transpiring in our country, regardless of how people might be embracing lawlessness, that shouldn't cause us to completely lose hope and to lose heart and to be dismayed and want to run and hide and sequester ourselves. Paul instructed Titus 
to go and appoint elders in every town. And one of the reasons he wanted him to do that was because the Cretan society was incredibly wicked. They're always liars. They're evil beasts. They're lazy gluttons. If my mom and dad were alive tonight, my dad would be 100 years old. My, my mom, my mom would be 97. I grew up learning from my parents that Americans are patriotic. I grew up learning from my parents that Americans are law abiding. I grew up learning from my parents that Americans are generous. That's not what characterizes our country today, sadly. Perhaps two or three generations ago, that was the case, but it is no longer. But we should not be discouraged. We should not lose heart because the gospel is designed to change the hearts of those lawless individuals, of those ungodly individuals, of those un in individuals who would steal property, who would destroy property, who would act in such an undisciplined and totally uncontrolled manner. We need to be ready to share the gospel so that they might be saved so that they might be changed and transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So take heart. Don't be discouraged. Recognize and understand that the darker it gets leading up to the return of, of Jesus Christ, the more someone converting to faith in Jesus Christ through belief in the gospel, will bring light to a world that desperately needs it. I really want to encourage you with this passage. Paul then says, continuing in verse 13, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. In other words, rebuke those who are like practicing the culture of the Cretan society of that day. Don't let that slide, Titus. Make sure they understand that is unacceptable behavior that does not bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the from the truth. Again, emphasizing these people who need to be refuted, who need to be refuted because they contradict sound teaching. And he's really, you know, aiming, <laughs> he, he's aiming his theological howitzer at the circumcision party here throughout this paragraph, because he makes reference uh, to uh, Jewish aspects here on a couple of different uh, occasions. Okay, moving ahead, verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. I find it interesting that the first mention of one of the key phrases of the book of Titus, the key phrase, good work or good deed, depending on your translation, is in the context of talking about individuals who are unfit for any good work or any good deed. All right, so to summarize once again, 
verses 10 through 16 comprise a seven verse paragraph explaining what Paul means when he says that elders need to not only be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, but they also need to be able to rebuke those who contradict that sound instruction. Well, I trust that you've been encouraged tonight as we've taken a look at this passage. I hope you're encouraged by the word of God. I know that I am. I'm encouraged knowing that Jesus Christ is going to return. And for those of us who are alive and remain, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we're going to be caught up together the resurrection and the rapture. We're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will be with the Lord forever. I'm encouraged thinking about that event, knowing that until that event comes, and until I either die or experience the resurrection and the rapture, God wants me to be studying his word, to be obeying the commands of Jesus Christ, to be encouraging others and building them up in the household of faith, to lead godly lives worthy of our Lord until his return. And I wanna encourage you to do the same. Now, next week, we're going to take a look at Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, where the focus will be on the teaching of sound doctrine. In two weeks, we'll look at my favorite passage in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. And again, I believe that paragraph is a major occasion for writing the book as a whole. Well, I hope to see you next week, and uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to reconnect uh, next Tuesday night. Uh, Until then, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time. Father, thank you for your word. May we take it to heart tonight. Might our lives be changed and transformed as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.